I think there's a real possibility of sort of having an underlying tailwind now, if you will, to nuclear sort of coming back into favor, uh, really with the public, more so with necessarily with investment markets or with the public in the last big uranium cycle that we had. Hello and welcome to Assay TV. We're catching up with Lara Mead Resources, the diversified uranium development company with assets in the US and Australia. And I'm pleased to be speaking with Mark Henderson, who is the president, CEO, and director of the company. Mark, welcome. Yeah, good morning, Adam, and thanks for having me this morning. Yeah, welcome. Um, could you provide just a brief snapshot of the company to start us off? Of course. Uh, Laramide's a public company listed in uh, Toronto and also in the uh, Australian Stock Exchange, dedicated to development of uranium assets. And uh, we've been around for a considerable period of time. And we're very excited at the moment because we think we're entering into a brand new uh, bull market in uranium. It's been a long uh, period in the wilderness, if you will, as uranium was out of favor. But I think it's definitely starting to come back into favor. And uh, it's one of those commodities that's sort of a bit of a laggard. But I think it's uh, an interesting play on a bunch of levels. Uh, including as this whole reflation trade takes takes hold in the world. We've got a suite of assets, um, development stage assets, late stage development assets that were selected for their um, position in the cost curve and their ability to deliver and to be a reliable supplier of choice to basically nuclear utilities in the world. We have two core areas. One is Australia and the other one is in the United States. And they're roughly equivalent in terms of the resource scale of those projects, but very different projects. And obviously we can speak to those as we get, get into the interview a little bit. Yeah, definitely, and we'll come on to focus on those. Um, but first, let, let's focus in on what you were mentioning there around you know, the, the macro outlook and why this is an exciting time for the uranium market. You know, it's probably the best fundamentals we've seen in, uh, in quite, some, quite some time. Um, could I just get your view to explain those and what's driving uh, the price recovery for uranium? Sure. Yeah. I mean, uranium is obviously it's part of the energy complex, but it's a it's a little bit of a of its own um, in its own world just because of uh, uh, the nature of what of what the uranium is used for is obviously nuclear nuclear power plants, nuclear power plants and nuclear electricity production are sort of the longest lead time, longest business cycle things you can have in in the business world. Um, you know, a nuclear new nuclear plant costs roughly $5 billion for a gigawatt of capacity. There's an immense amount of planning and what have you that goes into that. By the time you get into start to finish from the idea that you are a nation state that might want to add nuclear to the mix, you're into kind of a 10 year process. So this is this is an industry that moves very, very slowly. You know, you have that sort of turning around a super tanker kind of analogy when when things are going well or going slowly. The tanker has been turning here now for a long period of time. We've been a bear market for about 10 years. And that really was partly as a result of, of forces first relating to, you know, we had the GFC in 08 when people were concerned about the CapEx intensity of nuclear, really, because as I mentioned, you know, it's not, it's not a, a cheap undertaking to basically decide you want to have nuclear in the, in the electricity mix. Um, and then we had a big supply disruption hiccup as a result of what happened in Japan with the nuclear um, accident, tsunami, et cetera. And it's been very slow to come back as they sort of entirely looked at the security safety protocols of all of nuclear. And that, that issue then kind of swept across all of the nuclear operators in the world. So it's, it's been a little slow to come back, a little slow to start adding new nuclear. But we're in a position now where there's, there's basically growth slated out under any scenario that you look at, even the low case scenario. Um, really out to 2035. And that sort of encompasses certainly projects like ours that are the next suppliers, if you will, um, to the nuclear industry. Um, that's going to encompass really the, the entirety of the development sector, in my view, because they're just the resource base, global resource base of the industry is frankly not that high in an industry that when you build one of these new plants or you make a commitment to nuclear, you know, you're making a probably nowadays a 60 year commitment. These plants are licensed initially for for 60 years. So you got to find 60 years of fuel. So that's really the underpinning of what's driving. And we've been through this long, long period of time where, you know, nuclear was kind of in the penalty box because it's disconnected from other fundamentals. Like I do like to tell people it's, this is the one thing, one commodity, it's probably the least GDP correlated commodity in the whole periodic table because of that. And so you have to look at it a little bit differently than you might look at a copper or an oil. And when, for example, you know, all the whole energy complex is performing very well right now. It's on a, on a 
you just had a huge year, obviously, as oil and gas have recovered, et cetera. Renewables are very, are very are doing very well. Nuclear, because it's in that weird little cycle on its own, it's really going to be the laggard, but it, it has the potential to do as well, if not better than all the other forms of energy generation. Yep, absolutely. And thinking about energy generation, you know, um, I, I would like to get your view on, you know, where nuclear might sit with regards to renewables as well. We've seen a lot of emphasis on decarbonization and ESG being essential now, not just for investors, but for, you know, um, for governments and society. Um, nuclear within the clean energy mix or helping reach these decarbonization goals seems to be uh, more uh, viable and more uh, accepted you know, uh, as we look to solve this challenge um, globally. I uh, just wanted to get your views on that as another sort of angle for why um, investment could be driving towards uh, nuclear and uranium-based projects. Yeah, I, yeah that's, a, that's a good point. I think there's a real possibility of sort of having an underlying tailwind now, if you will, to nuclear sort of coming back into favor, uh, really with the public, more so with necessarily with investment markets or with the public. In the last big uranium cycle that we had, which was really from 2002 to 2008, there was, a, there was an underlying thematic, which was kind of the, the nuclear renaissance is what the folks in the industry talked about it. And it was really China deciding to, to go nuclear from having no nuclear to going to 60 gig. And they did it in a very methodical fashion over a 15 year period of time. And of course they delivered on it by and large, and they're really almost at 60 gig now. And now they're talking about the next wave. The, the, the possibility we have now because at that point in time, and really in, the, in that era, 10 years ago, they, we started hearing about ESG, we started hearing about net zero. People really weren't doing that much about it. You started to add renewables to the grid. I think we're at the point where the, 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 the world has really decided we're going to phase out coal. And we've had a period of time when we've done a lot on the renewables front. And I think we're at that kind of inflection point where we say, well, maybe we can't do a whole lot more with just renewables. And we're going to have to go back and figure out where's the baseload coming from. And so that when you really start asking the hard questions about that, it's very hard to take nuclear out of the mix. And I think that's what a lot of these countries are doing. So it's sort of been by design and whether the political leaders are doing it and started getting more favorably to discussing it in a more favorable manner, or this groundswell is coming from the public and from the next generation that really considers you know, climate change the issue of the day, you're starting to see a real change in attitude around, hey, we ought to think about nuclear. You know, Today's nuclear is not your father's nuclear. Um, you know, the methodology is different. The plant safety is completely different, et cetera, et cetera. And by the way, irrespective of that, the, the safety director of the industry is really phenomenal compared to any kind of industrial activity that's ever happened. So re realistically, um, so I, I do think it's got that, that potential. And I, I think that's, and the other thing that we have now, which we didn't have 10 years ago, is the whole rise of passive investing, thematic investing, et cetera. And if nuclear gets put in the ESG club, if you will, that's an incredible tailwind because of the amount of capital that could f effectively flow to it, both in terms of the, across the whole fuel cycle, obviously building reactors, but obviously our tiny little sector, the, the Iranian production itself is a tiny little sector of um, the overall activity in the, nuclear, in the nuclear power industry. I mean, the fuel makes up 5% maybe of the cost of a kilowatt hour. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just thinking uh, on a global level, then, um, is there sort of a security of supply risk element in terms of where the supply could come from? Uh, you know, you're at an advantage being, uh, you know, in the US and Australia, you know, mind friendly jurisdictions, but also, you know, not part of the former Soviet bloc or Russia, um, not uh, within China as such. So, you're at an advantage in terms of doing deals with the utility buyers and, and um, uh, building out um, uh, the, the infrastructure from there. Um, well, we, we, when we, well, obviously when we built our asset base, we were kind of cognizant of that, but it, it, it's interesting because that really hasn't transpired as much in nuclear as you might think. I mean, you would sure. think you would worry about it. I mean, part of the reason, for example, say Japan went and built nuclear is they, you know, they didn't have their own sources of energy and they were very concerned potentially about the ability of having um, 
embargoes and things like that. This goes way back to when they first put their nuclear on in the 70s. Mm. And so the thing about nuclear is, you know, it's very, the footprint is tiny and the amount of fuel you can store in a very small place is very tiny. So those kind of issues have always permeated the nuclear business, if you will. But as it's, as it's turned out, really, that really isn't an issue. And I think of any, of any group of, of organizations that are a global thing that all look out for each other, I would say the nuclear business is very, very, is very, very at the forefront of that. And there's been lots of talk about having a nuclear fuel bank in, I believe it's Kazakhstan, et cetera, so that effectively the nuclear utilities don't really have this whole scenario where all the lights might go up because they don't have fuel. I don't think that's a realistic scenario. No, the, the, where this manifests itself is more in price because if the buyers get a little too cute with where they want to buy, procure their supply, that's really more where the, where the angle is for companies, potentially for investors, because you go through these incredibly long periods of time, like just gone through with this bear market and and you know the the price is at a level that doesn't make sense and it doesn't make sense really for today and it does, certainly doesn't make sense for five years ten years down the road so we've got to get in a situation where i think the price needs to go up to to incentivize future future production and future supply yeah absolutely and on that can i pin you down on uh, on, on what you see as you know the incentives to price um uh, incentive price sorry do you have a sort of a range that you're working towards um within your uh, modeling well i wouldn't i mean I, I would just sort of use the with the industry consensus i would think uh, certainly on the supply side you know i mean the buyers obviously have another view about where they should be able to buy supply and, and there are obviously low-cost producers and there's individual dynamics there about certain suppliers like kazakhstan frankly oversupplied the market into a market that where the signals were that we don't need it right at the moment Right. And then they finally dialed it back. But I think over time, the consensus has kind of developed that that number certainly somewhere north of $50. And realistically, if you look at where all the development projects are and what it would take to bring on enough supply that we, you know, we need roughly 180 million pounds a year. We've been living on above ground inventories and things like that that are going to diminish. I mean, if we have to live on 180 million pounds of new mine supply, the, the price that's really required for that is probably with a number somewhere north of $60, which is, you know, roughly double where we, where we are today. Yep. Thanks. Um, so we are still quite early in the cycle then you would say in terms of this uh, uptick and where the sector is going. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I use the analogy, I think we're in, if it was a baseball game, for those of you that understand baseball around the world, I mean, we're in probably the second inning, maybe going into the third inning. There's, there's, we've obviously had the stirrings, all the, all the uh, data points are there for those who believe in the thesis that the price can really only resolve itself higher. Mm -hmm. We've, we haven't really seen that much follow through on the price itself. But as I said, the, 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 it's a very lumpy sector that is a laggard and everything else. And when it does move, it tends to move quickly. Mm -hmm. So I think those are kind of the, we'll see the price action really to come next, but all the moves where people are getting organized, lining up. And really, the investment flows into the space look very similar to what they looked in, say, 2003. Now, the right. one big difference this time is we have um, an awful lot of retail that's been empowered in a variety of ways, including through things like zero commission trading accounts. You know, we're all familiar with Robinhood. Yeah. Uh, ETFs didn't exist in the last uranium cycle, for example. And there's now three, three ETFs in the business. One of them is approaching a billion dollars. Your laramides in two of the three ETFs. We expect over time we'll be in all of them. So those forms of flows into capital flows into the markets are something that's very interesting that that really wasn't there before. And you're starting to see things like suddenly there's some new uranium analysts and things like that things that only happen when the people get convinced that we're, we're going to have a we're going to have a run kind of thing. So yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of. Um interesting attention and analysis and commentary coming into the market. So it's a good time to be uh, getting still on, on, on where we're at right now in early stage within the cycle, as you say. So let's think then perhaps to your projects and how are you positioned for when the market does move on to that and the price does kick on uh, upwards again? Sure, yeah. So we, we have a very big project in Australia um, which is more of a conventional, you think of as a conventional mine, open pit type of mine, roughly can produce 5 million pounds a year for north, for, for north of 10 years. But obviously there's a CapEx associated, CapEx intensity associated with that. So we've done studies that are roughly around $300 million to bring that online. And obviously you'd have to permit it and what have you out of that. Um, that's a project that really probably, at, we think at 
50, $55, you'd start getting serious about bringing that, that, that project online. Um, and with the, the, the uh, suite of projects, if you will, that are out there in the world, and really they're all in these developers that are in these public companies effectively, plus a few nation state players, um, all of those projects have kind of a logical sequence on which they'll come up into the marketplace. There's a couple of very big lumpy projects because of the nature of the way the uranium is produced. So we have some, some projects in, in our country, Canada, that are very attractive, very low cost, but they, they, they can't come on in a, in a uh, methodical, slow way and do a buildup. It's basically, here you go, here's 20 million pounds a year. So you don't, you don't bring a project like that into a 180 million pound market without a lot of consideration. And probably that'll be contracted for by end users and things like that. So normally a thing like that would be quite disruptive, but given the nature of the business where it really is a contractual relationship and the only users are utilities that we're going to, we're going to have to see some of these parts move around. And I think when those things get sorted, I think the rest of the projects and really the price trajectory starts to fall into place because at 30, $32 where we are now, we have some of the bigger companies like Cameco, they have some of their very attractive projects offline. So they're trying to sort of balance the market, but it can change very, very quickly. And I think what we're going to see is we're going to see a move to 40 or so, 45 even. And then we're going to start to see the real action around projects and things will get positioned to actually come into the marketplace. Our American project, because it's an, what's an ISR, it's a, it's a solution mining in situ recovery, basically. Those projects are much lower uh, CapEx intensity, OpEx intensity, you know, sub $20 cash costs usually. And roughly they start at a million pounds a year because it's typically a, a, a well field or a formation oftentimes lends itself to that kind of production. The biggest ones in the world, even in Kazakhstan tend to not be more than about 3 million pounds a year. And the individual uh, mine, well field, whatever you want to call it. Um, so those, projects probably as we move up are going to be some of the ones that feed into the market into the marketplace but yeah we think i mean we think that on our american stuff that that can happen obviously well before the australian thing because at 45 dollars you'd be you'd be really thinking about bringing it into the marketplace re relatively quickly the other thing about about having a project that can produce at roughly a million pounds a year is you're not really reliant on the utilities there's no reason at all you can't sell that project into the spot market Right, excellent. And just to get a bit more specific on the American project, it's to do with the, the nature of the project itself and the sort of lower lying um, resource, if, if I'm not mistaken, in terms of the, um, the cost of um, producing uh, from that project, right? Yeah, because it's basically, you know, you have a, an aquifer that's got uranium in it that you're, you're remobilizing the uranium into solution and pumping it to the surface, but it's essentially a well field operation. So, and, and probably with a final recovery plant, but uranium generally lends itself to relatively easy recovery compared to, you know, some of the processes you need in order to liberate zinc or steel or sorry, steel, sorry, copper or some of the other, some of the other uh, commodities, yeah. you know, the metal, the metallurgical piece of uranium is generally relatively simple and that tends to lend itself to operating costs. But the real CapEx saving is, you know, there's no big mine with big mine equipment. There's no shaft as there would be in in Canada I mean in Canada with these projects these new projects you have not one shaft but two shafts that have to be sunk before you're going to produce anything yep. because of the ventilation issues and everything else so they just the capex is even though they're very attractive from an operating cost perspective the upfront capex is very very significant whereas in ISR your upfront capex time to market is very much quicker because of the nature of what you're doing excellent some real uh, advantage there um, so can we just turn to the company financials then, um, just to get a summary there. You're obviously in quite good shape, but uh, if you could just talk us through um, the capital structure. Yeah, so the capital structure is there's about 175 million shares out now. We've just had a big warrant exercise that added about six to seven million shares. So that improved the cash balance now. We're probably looking at cash and securities of north of $4 million. Um, there's a because of finances that we did related to our acquisition in the United States, starting in 2016, 17, there's a whole series of warrants that are now coming to the end of their lives and they're all in the money and they're all probably in a sequential manner going to get exercised. And that brings in another um, probably 14 to $16 million here over the next 18 months. 
but but within six months we have another two warrant series that bring in a significant amount of money. So you know we may raise some money if prices get better, but we're, we're it's going to only be in an opportunistic manner. We think we're very well positioned now financially. The the burn rate in the company is very low because obviously the 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 burner's been turned down for a long period of time in the Iranian business, and we've been in a position where we've just been trying to grind our costs down and get our holding cost basically essentially to hold the assets and be positioned for when the market was ready. And, you know, we think we, we think we're in a very, very good position to do that. So we can, you know, our holding costs on the, on our uh, entire portfolio is probably under $500,000 a year. Excellent. Very good. Um, so just for the investors uh, paying attention to the sector, not only are they going to be watching, you know, the Iranian price, uh, spot price, um, but what should they be looking for from, uh, from you uh, in terms of milestones towards the end of this year? Well, we are because we we can see now visibility that you know the bear market's over. Uh, we need to get more active. We we're, we're moving quite deliberately now to get all these projects you know rebooted, active on the ground. Um, we have activities planned on all the projects you know for the 2021 year. We're actually just about to start uh, in Queensland with a small project, and we're then hopefully going to the territory. Um, after that, now the one caveat with that is the Australian situation on the ground, unfortunately, with COVID is very fluid. Um, you know, you, you would hope we'd be coming to the end of it, but they're actually going into a thing where they're like, Sydney's about to go into a lockdown. So when you're trying to plan these programs, we, we had a frustrating experience last year. We actually were trying to get in the field last year, late last year, and we weren't able to do it really because of COVID. So we're hoping that we're going to be able to get these programs off the ground this year. The U.S. stuff is really all about permitting. So we're going to do a, a big restoration study that's basically the backbone of the final permit that we need in order to get our New Mexico state permit. At that point, the project will effectively be permitted. And so we are starting to do the things we need to do to, you know, be quote unquote shovel ready for when the time comes. Yep. Excellent. Kind so of- there'll be news flow. And obviously the macro is really the, the, the macro in uranium, I would say up to when we get to the 40, $45 level is probably the single most significant driver of these stocks. And at that point, I think the, the, the investors are going to get a lot more discerning about what the what the real order of how these projects come online are, where everybody then sits on the cost curve, you know, margins. You transition more from an asset based value methodology to to really a sort of cash flow earnings driven methodology. But we're not we're not there yet, really, in this sector because of we really I mean, we're sitting at a price that's that's below the, the cost at which even the best producers can can make any real money at the only the only producer making real money here is probably Kazakhstan and that and even then they're only probably making money from their lowest cost projects. Yeah, absolutely. To thinking of what you're saying, then you know, uh, paying attention to the macro, you know, now's a good time to position into uh, junior uranium uh, exploration and development companies, obviously for investors because. Uh, you know, stocks have been on a bit of a tear and they've sort of plateaued for, for and come down just a little bit um, in over the last month. So now it's the time, really. Well, it's a tiny sector. So you have to remember that it is a tiny sector. So if any of these flows start to happen in a meaningful way and that we really we've seen a little evidence that it's starting to get interesting and things like that. But that really I would say that really hasn't happened yet. And when I see there's kind of a progression of investors that come to these sort of deep value things and we've sort of gone through the deepest contrarian types, we're into the hedge fund part of it where they're all trying to get positioned. And at some point it goes to the more generalist investors, the resource investors, then ultimately, you know, retail will get excited about it when there's price performance. You know, they tend to, they tend to chase, and not wrongly, but I mean, that's where the money's to be made oftentimes in the volatility and the price performance. We're really not at that phase yet. I mean, re- there's a little bit of retail interest in this, but it's very, very early. Yeah, interesting. Um, that's good to good to note, and uh, still very a long way to go. And important to note that we're at the uh, the early stage or the second innings, as you mentioned before. Uh, Mark, thanks very much for sharing your insights, and um, it's very interesting uh, to get your update um, for investors interested in this sector. I uh, look forward to catching up with you again on Asset TV later in the year for an update. Yeah, thanks, Adam. My pleasure. Look forward to it. Take care.